with that, I want to segue into um, actually the world's first exosome-based test uh, that is commercially available today. Uh, it's the EPI test, ExoDX Prostate Intelliscore test. So this is a commercially available urine-based liquid biopsy assay for prostate cancer um, detection. So in the, in the prostate cancer case, um, today we're using PSA as a screening test. And it's been recognized that PSA has a lot of disadvantages. It's a very, um, it's a test with very low specificity, which leads to a lot of men um, uh, going in for suspicion of prostate cancer. So they have an elevated PSA and they go in and they do a biopsy, but they don't find um, uh, treatment worthy or prostate cancer in, 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 uh, in the majority of patients. So the USPSTF have actually um, recommended that, that uh, even if you have an elevated PSA, that doesn't, shouldn't lead to an automatic uh, biopsy decision. It's a shared decision that you do together with your, your urologist. So we position the APTI test to come in and help in this uh, situation where you have an elevated PSA but the PSA is in the gray zone. So if a PSA is between two and 10, that means um, that's where PSA doesn't really work uh, well at all. And we want to have a test that helps the patient and the clinician make a better choice of who goes forward with a biopsy. So the test is developed to rule out unnecessary biopsies because if the patient already have an elevated PSA, it's, he's ruled in to do the biopsy. So we want to have a test that rules out from biopsy. So it's not a, a rule in test in that manner. We, uh, we developed this uh, test over many, many years and, uh, and we've done not one, but actually two clinical validation studies. They're both multicenter blinded prospective studies. The first study was published in JAMA Oncology in 2016. And the second validation study was published in European Urology um, in 2018. And these are two studies done in the intended use population where doctors need an additional test. So basically in the PSA gray zone from two to 10. And that's very important um, because not all studies are created e equal. There are biomarker tests in this space that utilizes PSA in the algorithm, but um, they enroll patients with PSAs that are very high, well over 10, sometimes even over 100. And PSA actually works well when you have a PSA of 50 or 100. Uh, so enrolling patients with high PSA, when PSA is actually part of your score, is a little bit of cheating because you already know the, that, that that patient should go forward with a biopsy. So we, we stayed in the gray zone of PSA 2 to 10 alone. And we optimized the test for negative predictive value and, 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 and basically uh, made sure that our cohort is the same type of patient that the clinician will see. So it's all comers that come in with a PSA between 2 and 10. So the urine exosome isolation or urine exosome collection that is needed for a test like this is, uh, is a little interesting. I'll, I'll get to that because exosomes are present in urine. We all know that. And exosomes are released by the entire urogenital tract. So you find exosomes released from the kidney. So you can actually study kidney disease. You have exosomes released from the bladder. So you can study things that happen in the bladder, including bladder cancer, and you've got exosomes released from the prostate. However, uh, the prostate doesn't feed into the bladder, which um, uh, means that the prostate exosomes are only in the first catch, urine, the first 20 milliliters of urine that comes out when you pee. That's where your prostate exosomes are. If you have a cup, uh, and you continue to fill up that cup, you will actually dilute your prostate signal with bladder and kidney exosomes. So to prevent that, we have this device here where you 
urinate into this funnel, the urine is diverted down here into this cup, and the green thing is a float. When the first 20 milliliters of urine has, has filled the lower cup, this green float goes up and shuts off the, 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 the urine into the cup, and the urine is diverted out here instead, so it goes out in the toilet. That way you have a very controlled first catch sample that you can use for prostate exosome analyses. So uh, another description of the test. So the intended use is basically for a man uh, coming in uh, over the age of 50 and has a PSA in the PSA gray zone between two and 10, where PSA doesn't really work. Uh, the, the option for this man is then to, should we proceed with a biopsy? And as you know, a biopsy is a very invasive process. It's usually done by a transrectal uh, 12 core biopsy into the prostate and there are some side effects with that. Uh, in this case before you proceed with that decision you can urinate into the cup and we'll tell you what your risk score is for having uh, prostate cancer or Gleason 7 and above prostate cancer. So the exosomes that are isolated from the urine we crack open the exosome, so all the RNA goes out. So remember, we have over 30,000 different types of RNAs that, are, that we could monitor, that we could profile. But in this case, we do qPCR of only three genes. Those three genes go into a, an algorithm that generates a score that falls in on the, the range of 0 to 100. And if you're below 15.6, you're actually negative. Uh, for the for the test, so the, the the result is reported out on this very simple report where it tells you where you fall on this zero to one hundred range, and and if you're either negative or positive uh, with the epi test, and the performance of the test has been validated in two independent validation cohorts. So remember, this is very unusual for a diagnostic company to do that. Usually you do one validation and you stop. Because if you do another validation and the result is different, you're basically screwed. <laughs> so, so it's very important uh, that, that they, they overlap. And we were so confident with the performance of the epi because we had done several clinical cohort prior to the validation studies where we actually validated the signature. Um, the, the prospective validation cohorts that I'm talking about now, they're not validating the signature. They're actually validating the cut point, which is another level of validation that you, you go through. And the cut point of 15.6 achieved a negative predictive value of 91% and a 92% sensitivity. And that's for Gleason 7 and above. Uh, if you are familiar with prostate cancer, you know that uh, there, there are uh, some Gleason 7s that are known as four plus threes uh, that, that or sorry, uh, Gleason 7s that are three plus fours that are sort of an intermediate risk. And um, if you define those into the negative group and only define high grade as four plus threes and, and above, you have a negative predictive value of 97%. And um, if you combine both of these validation studies together, having over a thousand patients in the, in, the, in the cohort, the sensitivity is 93% and an MPV of 90%. And if you define high grade disease as Gleason 4 plus 3 and above, the MPV goes up to 96%. Another way of illustrating this performance is by this um, risk stratification plot where we show you the epi scores on the x-axis and the percent prost that your, your risk of finding prostate cancer on the biopsy. So if you have an epi of 0 to 10, this is your risk score. And if you have an epi of 50, you actually have around 50 or just over 50% chance of finding aggressive prostate cancer. But you actually have an 80% chance of finding any cancer. So if you have a score of 50, you got a 50% chance of Gleason 7 or above. 
and an 80% chance of having any prostate cancer. And uh, to summarize the, the EPI, so it's basically a, a test that adds new information that is independent of clinical variables such as PSA and, 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 and other, other uh, factors. We chose to not include PSA in our algorithm because we wanted to have a test that is completely unique and adds clinical value to the doctor using information that he or she wouldn't have otherwise. So other tests often bake in the PSA score into the algorithm to increase the performance of the test. However, we feel like the doctor already has that PSA information and clinical history and, 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 and we, we want to have something that is uniquely providing value. Uh, we know that the EPI test as a standalone test outperforms all of the standard of care parameters that are used today, including uh, family history, PSA value, positive DRE, etc. And uh, it's now included in the NCCN guidelines. And the EPI test recently received an FDA breakthrough uh, designation. So we're very happy with that. So, Another topic for exosome-based research is developing new diagnostic signatures. And there are many ways of doing that. And there's a lot of activity in this space, in, in academia, in pharma, and at exosome diagnostics. Um, we found that actually machine learning, or AI, for generation of new exosome-based signatures are very useful. And we, we use the bladder cancer signature as, as a test case for, for this. When you're talking about developing new biomarker signatures, uh, unfortunately, there's almost like a crisis out there in the, in, the, in the biomarker field. Because if you look at biomarkers in general, this is not, has nothing to do with exosomes specifically, but for biomarker, biomarkers in general, most of the literature shows wonderful performance of biomarkers, but they they're never commercialized, so they are not, never validated. And um, it's a dilemma because most biomarkers that are published actually fail when they go through the validation. As an example here, um, this graph from uh, Professor Tobias Schöblum in Uppsala shows that there's over 6,000 biomarker papers published and over 1,000 patents on biomarkers just in one year. But on average, we get 2.3 approved tests per year. So there's a discrepancy here. And it's a crisis that we have to solve. We help, have to uh, help each other to do the right thing and not just uh, move forward with biomarkers that are improperly uh, designed and, 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 and tested. And most, most, uh, in most cases, people don't think about the proper platforms that they utilize for their biomarker isolation as well as the analytical part of the biomarker. So it's very important. You also have to have a biomarker uh, isolation platform that is, is uh, unaffected by the biofluid matrix effects. Because we are all different and different biofluids have very different uh, content and, and uh, can actually skew your biomarkers once you start to do real life patient testing. So, and you have to also optimize and validate the particular biomarker of, of, of choice with your sample collection methodology. And this is very important. And in, 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 in many cases, this is not done. Often you find your patients from one clinic, and you take your controls for another clinic and the controls might be healthy. The controls may not be the, the patients that, that the doctor is trying to differentiate uh, between. So what we, uh, when we uh, set out to utilize a more data-driven discovery or machine learning um, approach to this, we try to utilize all of the features of the exosomes. So we know that there's a lot of different protein combinations on the exosomes. There's RNA markers, there's metabolome, there's a lot of different things, uh, more things than we can actually comprehend. So having uh, machine learning for this is actually helpful where these, some of these combinations can certainly increase your specificity. And 
in this case, we built this uh, machine learning tool that we named Bionic <laughs> that can do biomarker prioritization, but can also figure out sort of enrichment targeted identifications or variant calling. So I'm going to focus on the biomarker prioritization effort because that seems to be why a lot of uh, these studies fail in validation trials. Because typically when you want to find biomarkers for disease, you can pick two options. You can either go into the literature, mine the literature, and you can search um, for, for, for uh, biomarkers for your disease indication. But in many cases, the data that you're finding in the literature may not be from EVs. They're in tissue and they may not always overlap. You have no control over the study design. And like I mentioned, all these thousands of biomarkers that are found in the literature, many of them don't pan out. You can also do a high throughput screen of biomarkers. The problem with those is that they're expensive and very likely underpowered. Because when you're looking at thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of different analytes and you have a cohort of 100 patients, you're never going to have a well-powered study. And you're always going to overfit your, your data. And, and, and that's, that's a challenge. So having sort of an extra layer of controls in your process is helpful. So what we, uh, what we built in this machine learning tool was basically first figure out what mRNAs are dysregulated in the disease process, of course. And then we marry that with what are the RNA patterns that we're seeing in the biofluids. Because the biofluid RNA patterns aren't the same as you see in the tissues. So we've generated over the years a very large database of liquid biopsy data that, that can actually be married to the tissue RNA data. So we figured what, which mRNAs overlap between, between the, the tissue and the urine exosomes for bladder cancer. And there are also things that will affect your results. For example, um, bladder cancer patients often come in with blood in the urine. And if you're taking controls versus patients and the controls don't have the same amount of blood in the urine, you will actually just find a biomarker that is due to hematuria. And that's not really your goal. So we m wanted, for example, to make sure that the mRNA targets that we're finding are completely unaffected by non-bladder exosomes such as blood in the urine. So the bionic approach, actually from all these thousands and thousands of possible RNA targets for bladder cancer, uh, it found 16 uh, that, that uh, would fit our criteria. And the first thing we did was to test it out. So did it work? Did the, the, the artificial intelligence profile um, do what we hoped it did? So we took urine. So this is uh, normal urine here. And then we had different amounts of blood in the urine. So from a little bit of hematuria to a lot of blood, and this is, please go see a doctor <laughs> because you have something going on. And when we, we, we ran actually hemoglobin RNA in the exosomes as a control, and hemoglobin RNA is highly affected uh, by the amount of blood spiked into your sample. But none of the markers that was selected by the Bionic platform were affected at all uh, by the blood spike in, even if you had this much blood in the urine. So that was really, really uh, fascinating. And then we ran just a proof of concept study in, uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, 81 patients. And, and, and ran the, the signature and were successfully ruling out the he healthy individuals using this uh, predefined uh, signature. So that was uh, quite fascinating to see. So to summarize the exosome platform, we, we really think that the exosome liquid biopsies uh, sets a new gold standard for liquid biopsies because it enables you to go beyond oncology. So within oncology, you can do complete RNA transcriptome profiling. You can increase your sensitivity for mutation detections. You can look at splice variants. You can look at fusions on RNA. 
but you can also go into the non-oncology areas, which is actually a bigger field, uh, but is usually forgotten because the liquid biopsy space is based on circulating tumor cells or CT DNA, of course, don't have the same applications in, in, uh, in uh, cardiovascular disease and, and, and neurodegenerative disease, et cetera. So really, really uh, moving the space beyond cancer as well is very important. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs>